Welcome. I'm Julie Thompson, Executive Director of PAC TV, and today we're hosting a COVID-19 update for the town of Pembroke. We're hosting these forums every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. Watch in Pembroke on Comcast Channel 15 or online on our streaming channel by visiting pactv.org live. To ask questions during the forum, please email them to pembrokeinfo at pactv.org. For forum replay schedule and additional Pembroke meeting coverage, please visit pactv.org slash Pembroke. Sabrina Chilcott, Pembroke's Assistant Town Manager, will moderate the forum and will introduce the participants that are contributing today. Welcome, Sabrina. Thank you, Julie. Good morning to you. We are uh, very pleased and gratified and thank PAC TV very much for their hosting of these Zoom forums on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 o'clock. The Pembroke Emergency Management Agency wanted to be able to regularly update and release information and discuss any new changes or any uh, new status updates regarding the town, the residents, and how they are affected by the COVID-19 protocols that have been put in place. Today, we are joined by Council on Aging Director Gretchen Emmets, Pembroke Housing Authority Direct Executive Director John McEwen, Pembroke Public Schools Superintendent Aaron Obi, Health Agent Lisa Cullity, and Mindfulness Coach Mary Beth Sheehan. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. To start off the, the roundup this morning, we'll bring in uh, the Emergency Management Co-Director and Health Agent for a brief update on activity that happened since Friday. Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about the town's state of health, what, uh, what activities were observed over the weekend, and what the cases look like? Certainly. Um, on Friday, we saw the anticipated spike in cases. Um, it was followed by a day of no cases, but I have a feeling that's more of a computer update um, scenario that's going to, to come through, and we're going to see more cases again today. Um, so the total number of cases over the weekend was 10. Um, I expect that number to continue to go up. We're seeing that spike that we anticipated for so long um, occurring around the state. That is occurring, obviously, in some communities at a higher rate than other communities. Um, so basically we're on track. We're, we're about where we thought we would be at this particular time. I expect the governor to have some more meaningful updates today. Obviously the anticipated date for starting to reopening things of May 4th is now just two weeks away. Um, and we have just started cresting our spike, um, that is anticipated to last approximately two weeks. So I expect that the governor within the coming days will make some adjustments to that number, which will then allow communities to begin to plan their reopening strategies and what that might look like. Um, now's not a time for people to become lax in their personal care or their personal hygiene or their personal protection. Um, it is highly advised, if not, you know, almost coming to the stage where we're going to become mandatory like other communities of wearing some sort of a facial covering to prevent the spread of the disease. Now is not a time to become lax in our hygiene. And now is not our, our time to become lax about social distancing. Social distancing should be maintained at the highest level possible. For the most part over the weekend, um, I took a couple trips around and I saw most people in public places, despite the beautiful weather, doing a pretty good job about staying away from one another. So that's uh, a great sign that the message is being received. Unfortunately, just like everything else, you see the few that are not doing those kinds of things, not wearing facial coverings, um, not keeping social distancing forefront in their mind. I, I hope that those people uh, evaluate the danger they present to others and, and adjust their behavior accordingly. Okay, that brings a really good point to the to the forefront. You've got a lot of folks at home who are doing their best, have been for several weeks now, about four weeks in the rearview mirror, at least another two to four in the in front of them. They're at the midpoint, so to speak, and we're going to use the peak as the midpoint. Um, what uh, what kind of behaviors are we looking to see? in our public places. I know grab and go has been successful at restaurants. I know that so far social distancing has been observed at these outdoor locations. Um, there have been a lot of questions received about things like exercise and moving around and what the right thing to do is. Do you have any follow up on that? Sure. There's nothing wrong with being outside if you're maintaining social distancing. There's nothing wrong with exercising. There's nothing wrong with 
with running, outdoor exercise within your own yard, any of those kinds of things. But obviously, social distancing is going to be key to that. Um, you, you don't want to suddenly be exercising and running in a group of people. That would be really dangerous, actually, because, of course, when you're running, you're respirating hard, therefore expelling more bodily fluids, therefore breathing harder, therefore more opportunity to ingest those, which would be the exact opposite of what you want to do. Having said all that, no, uh, simple exercise, walking, running, and things like that are, are great. And they're great stress relievers too. Everyone is stressed right now. And, and I hear, I'm, I'm beginning to hear more and more um, contact and contact calls to me specifically about reopening businesses. Why aren't businesses reopening? Don't you know that we business owners are suffering? Um, several, several phone calls and messages over the weekend. Of course, we know that. Um, Pembroke Emergency Management has not lost sight at all of the sacrifices being made. But as, a, as I've had to say to every individual, if we wholesale open up businesses, this virus will have an opportunity to spread more. If we don't gauge our slow reintroduction of business to the population and minimize people gathering in a small place, we will see explosions of COVID-19, just like we're seeing at nursing homes and other group settings. So we want to avoid that. It is not that the governor doesn't care. It's not that Pembroke doesn't care. It's not that anyone doesn't care. It's just you cannot value someone's opportunity for business over someone else's life. Um, so it's, it's got to be a balance. It's got to be a careful rollout and reopening. We understand people's patience um, as that you know, quote unquote, it's wit sends. And that's why I hope some of our guest speakers will have some advice for us on how to combat that. Um, but we are, you know, seeing that peak that we knew was coming. And I think we're going to get around that peak. And then I think, you know, it's after that, that we're going to be able to see a return to what we would call a more normal, but um, I'm going to refer to it as something differently as a new normal. Um, Cause I don't think things for a while are going to go back to the way they were pre COVID-19 or at least not that quickly. I'm going to circle back around to that. That's going to be a very important point. But to your uh, group homes and housing um, points of interest that you just brought up, I'd like to ask John McEwen a question or two about what he's seeing in the housing authority. But I almost want to take it back a step, John, just for folks who don't know. Um, how many facilities is Pembroke Housing Authority responsible for? How many residents do you serve in Pembroke? And then to follow up on the back of that, <coughs> if you talk about some of the measures that you've taken in common areas, because common areas are going to become a, a situation for you long term in terms of how to manage those. So will you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Yes, yeah, Sabrina. Um, so in Pembroke, we have a number of developments. Um, there are three elderly and disabled. Uh, developments across town. There are a number of scattered single family or uh, family units, the single family homes or town homes. Um, we also have a couple of group homes that are managed by um, healthcare and health service providers. And, you know, so it's a pretty interesting dynamic. Um, in total, I there's probably 200 or more of those residents while the housing authority also manages the town of Halifax where there are there is another elderly disabled development and also scattered family units also um, but cumul cumulatively I would say there are about five upward of 500 that uh, that we either house or or manage through a voucher um, here in the area um, some of the protocols that we put in place are trying to discourage public uh, visits and limit them only to those that are, you know, vital to their everyday and uh, well-being. Those would be PCAs, home care aides, uh, mm -hmm. visiting nurses, um, medical delivery services, which in some instances may include delivery of oxygen to uh, residents uh, that we house. Um, also meals, you know, Gretchen and even Ed Thorne, I've seen Ed out there uh, delivering meals. I mean, there's been an amazing effort put forth here in the town. Um, residents really are doing a good job about uh, following the guidelines that we recommend, you know, there's, there's no martial law imposed in the town or in the state, but there are strong uh, 
strongly worded guidelines, suggestions that, you know, my population is following. By and large, they're, they're very good about it. So the offices, while they remain closed to the public, are still up and running. Uh, I'm here every single day, seven days a week, uh, but staff comes in and out. The community buildings are still cordoned off. Uh, they can only access, residents and their care providers can only access to do laundry, uh, to get mail. Again, that mail isn't just uh, cards, which are you know highly recommended uh, because it sustains people during times like this, but it can also be medical supply deliveries too. Very good. Um, again, when we come back around at the end, I'm going to ask about long-term plans. So I just wanted to drop that out there. Now, Gretchen, John just brought up an important point. You're coordinating Meals on Wheels deliveries and food uh, drop-offs for more than just seniors right now, aren't you? And and to that point, how um, how are your seniors staying in touch with you? And about how many seniors do we have in Pembroke? Can you go ahead? So, um, yeah, absolutely. We are servicing uh, more than just the seniors right now. It has, with the two food pantries in town being closed, um, it's really um, become up to us, which is our pleasure to do, to help um, seniors. I think last week we delivered two seniors and just residents in um, Pembroke, over um, 40 residences for food. Um, and we're planning that again this week. Uh, we, I'm doing shopping, so if seniors can't go out and they need grocery shopping, we have people here that uh, are going out and getting their list, going, doing the best they can because not everything on their list is available, and then going to um, back to their home and dropping it off outside their door for them. Uh, that has really ramped up in the past two weeks, and I seem to think that it's going to be even more involved um, over the next week. I do have to say we've um, had two people that have really stepped up to the plate. Um, Teresa Marino, uh, I, you may have seen some of her pictures on Facebook. She's going around town doing the family porch photos, and the money that she makes off that, she's donating to our food fund, and we got a very generous donation from Murphy Electric and Industrial Control to help um, keep the population um, going um, for the next few weeks um, on, until we can get another food pantry open. Most food pantries right now, as you have seen, are struggling because they have just doubled, quadrupled. It's just amazing. Meals on Wheels provided by OCES, on, and we have our food manager here, Lori. She's here on a daily basis. We have volunteers on a daily basis going and um, still delivering meals every single day. And that has um, that number has increased also. And um, OCES has been very good about uh, being able to do that over the phone instead of normally they go in and they do a um, home visit. But right now they're discouraging that, but they're still providing the food and services for them. No, that's great. And how can people donate to this cause and actually help fill the coffers to allow you to shop and send volunteers out to service people in need? So Josh Cutler and I have been going over that um, over the weekend. We've kind of been going back and forth. And he and I, I think, are going to try and create a um, fund. And we're in the process of doing that. We'll probably roll that out towards the end of the week uh, that people can donate to an emergency assistance fund. But right now, um, if anyone wants to donate gift cards to Walmart or Stop and Shop, uh, please feel free to contact us. We are taking those. And that honestly is what is feeding our clientele right now. Uh, I went um, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday shopping, and we were here on uh, over the weekend filling bags. So we're ready to go for this week again. And I'm sure we'll do, do it again next week. And I have to say that I have two van drivers that have been amazing and they are willing to um, go out there and deliver this food. Um, and it's really, you know what, as, as much as um, it's part of our job, it really makes you feel good. Uh, I know that um, my family and I last week over Easter delivered some Easter baskets worth of food to people. And, um, you know, one of the women that we dropped it off to cried 
And you know what? That's what makes this all worth it. I mean, because you're out there helping people and, and that's really um, what it brings it down to. And, you know, I have um, Chris, my transportation coordinator, and <clears throat> Susan Larkin. They each come in one day to, to help me because it's, it got a little bit overwhelming. And um, they're so good, too. I, I'm really appreciative that I have a great staff behind me to help with this because we are, we are here and we are functioning. We're doing fuel assistance. We're doing SNAP. We're doing, you know, mass health applications. So we still are busy. And then we have all this other stuff also to um, try and manage. Understood. Mm -hmm. Ms. Obi, at the Pembroke Public Schools, you have about how many students and families that you serve? And after that point, um, education and active learning has begun or uh, distance learning has begun. And I'd ask you to talk a little bit about that and wrap with meals. I believe that's still happening over at Hubbamuck Elementary School. Is that correct? Yep. So we have um, about 2,900 students in Pembroke. Um, this um, today starts our third week of, we're calling it remote learning. Um, I think everyone's kind of in a groove now. Um, we are expecting obviously some guidance today from both Commissioner Riley and Governor Baker on whether the school closure will be extended um, or whether it'll be closed for the rest of the year. As some Lisa referenced earlier, we're two weeks out from the original date and it doesn't appear as though reopening on May 4th is going to be um, plausible at this point. So we are starting to plan for what, what remote learning could look like for the remainder of the school year, as well as starting to look at what summer school could look like for our, um, our extended school year pop population. We do um, run a special education summer school. Um, and even with that, starting to plan for what the fall will look like. So some of the measures in place around um, six feet of space, some of the ideas that have been thrown out there is having staggered school, meaning one week, one group of kids comes, another week, another group of kids comes. Um, a whole bunch of logistical pieces that we do um, really need to spend some time to kind of vet out and work through what makes the most for our students and families here in Pembroke. Um, at the same time, we are offering meals still. Um, so we do our grab and go um, with breakfast and lunch at Habamak. Last week, it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This week, it is Tuesday, Thursday. Last Friday, we gave out 195 meals. Um, that is a an increase over the week prior, um, just given the fact that the, the, the pantry is you know closed and a lot of families are seeking alternate um, means for sustenance. So we expect that number to increase a little bit each week. Um, and you know our uh, our food service staff uh, under the direction of our food service director uh, Cindy Lucas Tara has been amazing. Um, the ladies are coming in and, and bagging up those meals and getting them ready to go. So. You know, I think there's a lot of questions out there still around what does graduation look like? Is there going to be a prom? Is everyone getting promoted to the next grade? And those are all still pieces that we're working through. Our intention is for every student to move on to their next grade level next year. Um, but just trying to figure out with an extended closure, our expectation is that the guidance um, from the state will be to focus on power standards, um, meaning, um, you know, highlight really important um, tasks that need to be completed by grade level. Um, so we were fortunate that this happened at, at the time that it did in the sense that by March, most of our grade levels have already taught 80% of the power standards. So it's a small amount of material that would need to really be introduced over this remote learning platform. So we're starting to plan for that today. We expect to hear from the governor and the commissioner early this afternoon on what our future holds. Thank you. Okay, one of the common themes here amongst these different demographics seems to be this um, not only sense of insecurity, pertaining to food, the economics, um, different uh, um, worries that families, you know, seniors, even children might have. So one of the opportunities that uh, the forum wanted to bring this week was to introduce Mary Beth Sheehan. Uh, Mary Beth is a wellness uh, counselor and, I'm sorry, a mindfulness counselor. Hello, I needed to be more mindful Hi. there. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we really do turn to you, Mary Beth, at this moment and say, okay, um, you're not, you know, the, this burden shouldn't fall to somebody, you know, specific to you, but we're going to ask you and tap you to bring forward some of these um, types of concerns that people have and things that they can focus on and actual steps that they can take. Could you talk a little bit about our well-being? Sure. Yeah, I've, I've had a lot of emails uh, come in over the past couple of weeks talking about people's anxiety increasing. Uh, children's anxiety increasing, 
And of course, everybody is in the same boat. Everyone's nervous. We don't know what is happening. Um, and I think the biggest thing is people lose, <clears throat> once they lose control over, you know, what we can't control and what we can't control, that anxiety does start to set in and fear starts to set in. So I think we're starting to see a lot of that. Um, and one of the biggest things is I always try to tell people just slow down and you really need to take some time to yourself. And, you know, what does that mean? So maybe getting outside for five minutes and thinking about the bigger perspective of things. So in the grand scheme of this, yes, we can't control what's happening, um, but we can control our reactions. So really bringing a conscious thought to how you wanna react, having compassion. Like I, Gretchen made a really good point on <clears throat> you know, how good it felt to do something good for someone else. And you know, I think we all need to really bring that together. And when you do good for somebody else or you go out of your way to help somebody else, you're not only helping somebody else, but you're helping yourself. And I think when you come from that compassionate standpoint, uh, it really helps to bring things into perspective here. So <clears throat> give yourself 10 minutes a day to sort of reflect on the bigger picture. A lot of times the way we do that is through breathing. So doing some really deep, strong breaths, um, especially if you start to feel anxiety coming on, that's a huge thing is to interject with your breathing and really remove yourself, get yourself in a safe space, creating a safe space in your home and bringing the perspective back to something positive. Uh, I always tell people, bring it back to something that you have gratitude for. And right now, if you're healthy and you're able to stay home with your family and your family's healthy and you, you know, you have people that are supporting you, then that's something really to be, um, to have a lot of gratitude for. So those are all things that we can do. And I think it's just taking it with the day by day perspective and not trying to let, I always say people's emotions get crazy and then they get on the crazy train. And when your thoughts get on the crazy train, uh, you tend to lose it a little bit. It's funny that you would say that because we're seeing a lot of, in, you know, spike and do, do DIY, you know, improvements around the home and mm -hmm. workouts from home and people trying to be creative with their outlets. But I have a question about the extroverts among, among us, the people who are socially sad. <laughs> do you, Absolutely. can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I'm one of them. Uh, <laughs> I really thrive off being able to, you know, be around people. And I think it's so funny because this has become, you know, our new normal. And I think, you know, especially for children, this is really important. Um, kids can fall into the, the habit of getting depressed really easily when they're not around their peers. So hmm. keeping this uh, line of communication open for kids and sort of exploring like, you know, they see social media in sort of a fun way and in a way before this all, um, it was just sort of something fun to do and they were constantly on it. But now it's sort of a necessity for them. And I think at some points, my, I find my kids sort of getting, um, getting annoyed by it though they don't want to use the iPad anymore and so <laughs> I think, uh, which is which is great but I do think for means of communication you know these things like zoom and and google meetup and and really teaching your kids how to interact and talk back going back to talking face to face like this it's an opportunity for kids to sort of uh, for anybody to stay connected you know and um, kids are so used to texting and we're also used to, you know, um, avoiding that sort of face to face sometimes. And I think this can bring it back to that. So using those opportunities um, to really have those teaching moments or even for anybody who is falling into a depression to sort of put themselves out there and contact people that you wouldn't normally contact uh, or that maybe you haven't seen in a while. And create those meetings and create those 
those special um, meetups. Virtual play dates. Different sites. Yeah. Virtual play dates. Adults are having them. They're having yeah. different kinds of congregate moments with the as Julie puts it, Brady Bunch screen with their yes. friends and uh, teachers are having trivia nights on these yes. same types of platforms. So theoretically, you could have virtual play dates. You know, where you can have virtual play dates. I had a, I met with uh, women that I went to high school with that I haven't seen in a while, and we all got together, and it was nice. You know, and you still will get that feeling of the connection, and that's what people need. So take the connection any way you can get it, huh? Absolutely. Very good, very good. Hey, Lisa, question for you. Yes. This week is gonna become very important, um, more so than weeks past because of the circumstances. If this town is at its peak, as the state believes that Massachusetts is starting to peak, um, I have some questions about what that peak would look like in terms of duration um, and consistency. Is it one of those up and downs? I mean, how is this gonna reflect itself and what, kinds of things will you be discussing in these daily meetings? Sure. So yes, I think it is going to be a lot of up and ups and downs. And I don't think that that's that the cases are going up and down. I think just the numbers that we're going to see every day are going to be ups and downs because of the system that's used to dispense that information because of the speed at which certain tests are being processed and certain other tests aren't being processed. So I think unfortunately that up and down is just going to naturally occur. Um, I don't think people should read too much into daily numbers. I think what they should, you know, be looking at is the total cumulative. Um, every indication we're seeing is that the state, if we're not, you know, at our peak, we're very, very close to it. Um, we're seeing obviously what we would expect to see. Unfortunately, a higher number of cases in urban areas, um, a higher number of cases in socioeconomically depressed areas and higher cases in congregate living um, scenarios, especially those scenarios that would have a more aged population at them. Um, so it, it appears is that we're going into it. Um, I, I have my Hogwarts background on just for you, Sabrina, because you always ask me to predict the future. Yeah. Um, so here I am going to give you my best prediction. Based on what we see the numbers doing, I, I'm going to expect the peak is going to last two weeks, maybe a little bit longer because we have flattened that curve. And as um, all the, the leading scientists have been telling us, the more you flatten the curve, the actually the longer it goes. Um, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Everyone's fed up with this. Everyone's done with this. Everyone wants this to go away. So that's in itself frustrating. But the positive of flattening the curve and it going a little bit longer um, means that our medical care facilities are going to be able to help all of those that need the help. And that's really important uh, because a, a lot of the loss of life that's been seen is when someone requires that high level medical treatment and it's not available to them. Because um, there's simply not the, the ventilator or the high level of care left because the beds are taken or the vents are gone or whatever else. So I think that we're looking at, at, a, at a two to three week span of some much higher numbers. I think when we see the numbers decreasing, as the federal government has alluded to time and again, that when you see those numbers on the decrease and on the decrease for a week or two weeks at a time is the time that we think we can start talking about opening up um, businesses and opening up um, different aspects of our everyday lives to, to a, a condition of like, like I'm not gonna say normal, not before COVID, but a new normal. And, and no doubt that's gonna come with a lot of guidelines. I, I would expect that when we're there, I, I think that this, like I said, this event's gonna last two to three weeks in Massachusetts. Remember other states are behind us and their timeline is very, very different. But I think we're gonna see two to three weeks of this. Um, I think we're gonna wanna see that solid week or two of declining cases to know that we've kind of rounded the turn. And I think, or I'm hoping, I shouldn't say, I, but I believe we will see guidance coming out from the feds and from the state of what reopening and re-emerging re is going to look like. I would expect it to include um, mandatory social distancing guidelines at private businesses. I would expect it to have uh, guidelines about capacity being reduced at different businesses, whether that be a, a restaurant or a food service establishment um, or other type of establishments that would be open to the public. I expect those numbers uh, to be capped or reduced for a period of time to help slow spread. I will not be surprised if if wearing of facial coverings of some, some sort as th those openings occur would be a requirement. 
um, th things of that nature. But again, you're asking me to predict the future, the best prediction, two to three weeks of this, another week or two of decline. And then we're going to start to see um, some of those, those businesses and things be brought back online. Understood. And, and, and as you pointed out, the federal government rolling to the state rolls down to the municipality. And I did want to talk a little bit about um, Pembroke and its municipality and, and, and its corporate structure and its economics. But I wanted to go first to Julie and find out if we have any questions coming in. Yes, um, Sabrina, I had, a, I had a couple and a couple comments too. It's probably for Mary Beth. There's so many people who for the first time have had to visit a food pantry or had take take advantage of that service for the first time have had to apply for unemployment insurance and they they're horrified that they have to do that can you just speak to those people and let them know that that's what it's there for and and not to feel badly about it but that's the safety net that's set up <clears throat> sure absolutely i think you know there's a lot of people finding themselves in those situations and uh I think the the thing to keep in mind that this is a small blip of time. This is temporary. So if you need it and you have it that's there, be grateful that it's there and use it. So if someone's willing to help out, that's okay. And, and be okay. And you really need to be okay with using that support and know that there is an end in sight here and you will get out of it and you'll get back on your feet. So I think you just keep the perspective of um, and the gratitude that you have it there to use and that you're, you're getting the support and that, you know, forgive yourself and be okay with it because um, we're all in this together and everybody is, is there to help each other out. So I don't think anybody should feel like, um, you know, be, that's being a burden by any means. Thank you. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, the other thing was on the unemployment. Um, it was just opened up yesterday, the portal for people who are um, self-employed or um, gig workers. And can somebody speak to that? Because that was that was an area of contention for a while. Lisa, do you want to go or you want me to go? Sure. Um, and the only reason I want to be clear, I am no expert on, on gig economy workers or any of this, but I've had the pleasure of being on so many shows with Josh Cutler that I'm going to give his spiel. So the, the gig economy workers and the self-employed weren't eligible um, for unemployment um, prior to this, but part of the CARES Act made them eligible. Um, Josh Cutler was very frustrated, as were uh, self-employed and gig economy workers, that the governor had anticipated that rollout was not going to be till April 28th or 30th. It was a, a much later date. However, um, probably due to many long, hard hours of many people writing a whole lot of code and a whole lot of portals um, to unemployment, that is up and running. It went up and live late. Uh, yesterday afternoon. So it's really important that those that have been waiting um, go ahead and get on there and get their applications set. Obviously, the, because these are gig economy and self-employed workers, there's a great deal more data entry that needs to be done on their part to be eligible for these benefits and services, but they are there. It is live. It is available to be applied for. And I know Josh Cutler's office, and I'm going to give a little shout out to my friend Cole there, um, have helped so many people that have had troubles, not just with the, the gig economy and self-employed information, but other unemployment questions and problems. Um, Josh Cutler's office has has really made themselves available to help people walk through this. And if you, you are a sole proprietor or a gig economy worker and you're going to the site and things aren't immediately obvious what you need to do and what information you need to go get and input, reach out to them because I know they've, they've just been a tremendous resource. So many people have told me how much um, they've helped. But uh, it is live and it's live 10 days in, 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 uh, in advance of anticipation of when it was. So uh, much gratefulness for that. Great. Thank you. I had uh, one more question that came in. Um, it's probably to you, Lisa. Once Governor Baker okay. loosens quarantine guidelines, will Pembroke continue to track and post new COVID cases? My family plans on continuing to quarantine for a few weeks after guidelines are changed in a case of resurgence. Yes. So it, we're 
our track is not going to change. Um, and if you want to throw up that town website with our red bar where we've been putting up all of our most important and pertinent information, sure. um, click right on the town of uh, Pembroke website right at the top there's a red banner for all things covid um we don't anticipate changing any of our tracking um we are going to adjust our guidelines in accordance with the governor obviously the guidelines are just that they're guidelines if you can do something superior or or you know quarantine longer or or stay isolated longer or social distance better that's always to your advantage especially if you are uh, over the age of 60 or immunocompromised or uh, perhaps have uh, any breathing or respiratory issues and you can do better than that, bravo, those are good things to do. Um, you know, if you, if you can do better than the guidance, obviously for some people that's not going to be a possibility. Um, there are people that need to get back to work. There are people that need to get back to doing so many things. So we understand that too. The only thing I would urge is people remain hyper vigilant. Um, you're your own best advocate. You're your own best uh, protection. Uh, don't touch your face, wash your hands, uh, stay out of large groups. This has always been the way to avoid this disease. And there's nothing like beating a disease other than avoiding a disease. Hey, um, Lisa, none of that's going to change. Sorry to interrupt. Testing. Yes. Um, what are you hearing about testing from DPH and what are they talking about with being able to test people for carrying the antibodies? Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. I haven't heard any widespread antibody testing yet. I know it's out there as pilot programs in a couple of areas. I have not heard any widespread antibody testing yet. Keyword yet in Massachusetts. I know that it's being done. I know that it's, but it's more like a pilot thing than a widespread thing. I would imagine again, here I am predicting the future, that the governor and, and DPH would be more focused on more COVID testing. In other words, sure. It's, sure. The, it's the tracking of the disease and the surveillance that's going to give us the best guidance on where to go. And I would imagine the focus is going to be there. I, I alluded to on Thursday, and I'll touch again quickly, the state is going to be stepping in on monitoring. And actually, there's several state calls today, which I need to be a part of. Um, that are going to talk about that, that contact tracing. I'm confident the governor is going to talk about it again today, which simply means the state's going to come in and assist towns in contact tracing. Right now, knock on wood, Pembroke is keeping up. We're doing a good job. We have a pretty good handle on our contact tracing, although there's many communities, not unlike Chelsea, not through any fault of Chelsea's, just the sheer volume of cases is making that very challenging for them. So the state has literally hundreds of contact tracing assist employees that are going to come online and help with that. So why does this matter to everyone? Well, the reason it should matter to everyone so much is as you start to talk about opening up and returning to normal, schools, work, uh, public areas, all these things that we all so desperately want to do, Knowing what areas are positive and are not positive and how safe it is, it, it's going to help set the barometer for what things can be done safely and what things can't be done safely. Um, so moving forward, that's our best indicator of how do we move forward as safe as possible. And it's funny that you would bring that up. When we turn on the news and we're all trying to find our two or three um, sourced news preferences for ourselves and our families, so we're not inundated with information that we can't you know, verify or validate. But you're seeing, um, as the timeline changes in each state, you're seeing these different kinds of testings. Yeah. And where we're at our peak, to your point, it makes more sense to be testing for the virus than it is to be testing yeah. for antibodies because we're not there yet. That would be a conversation for weeks from now. Um, so no, thank you for that. Uh, but I did want to just, as we wrap and we come back around again, um, to talk about the future. People are, in fact, doing these things. They're doing their best to Mary Beth's point. There's things that we can all take a moment for ourselves and actually think about, be grateful for, take a breath. And as we go forward, we're going to be walking into, as Lisa and I think John both said it, the new normal. So in a, a scenario where we phase out eventually, not yet, but as we phase out, people are going to be more respectful and more aware and doing what types of things. Gretchen, I wanted to start with you. Your seniors are going to have potentially the longest period of time where they need to be aware of the new normal and react to it. What do you hope that they take from this and what do you think would be good for them? Well, I hope that, you know, they take from it that, uh, 
everything that is being done for them is for their own um, their own house sake right now. And that when they do come back, uh, they come back more active. I think we're actually going to probably see more seniors at the center than we normally have. And I think we're going to have to roll that back very slowly, um, depending on um, what the Department of Health says. And, uh, you know, I was out this weekend and I want to thank um, Maureen Dorito, the First Church, and Gina Garrard for making masks for us because um, we've been delivering those to seniors. But I did notice that um, some people were out there and they seniors and they weren't wearing their masks and they didn't have any gloves. And I wanted to say that if they need anything, they need uh, masks that we can make arrangements to get them to them. And I think going forward, once we open, we're going to need to still have some shows of distancing. Thank and you. some um and Gretchen are masks available for anyone who needs them in in generally speaking we're talking about seniors but we're noticing a bit of reluctance on the part of your younger seniors to identify as seniors so how are you making those available sorry to interrupt no that that's fine we it's funny because uh we've been calling people on a regular basis and they're like, well, I'm only 62. <laughs> 60 qualifies as a senior here. And uh, I do have some here. Um, people are making more from us. I do get some from Lisa. And I know, I think John had some for the housing um, that he has. So we can make masks um, available. I am leaving them here. I have a mailbox out back underneath my ramp. So if someone needs them, I just stick them in an envelope and stick them in that mailbox and they can come and pick them up or we can drop them off. And the bags of food that are going out this week, they're each going to have a mask, a handmade mask in them um, that were made by some of our volunteers. No, that's excellent. Thank you. And John, let's touch back to you uh, going forward, the housing folks in the group homes and in your senior facilities and disabled um, living arrangements with your residents at your areas. You're going to have a longer period of time to consider how that laundry and mail situation in your common areas is going to work. Have you started to put any thoughts to that? Or are you just waiting for more information? What is your team doing? Well, I think that the one thing that's going to help us all in that respect is going to be the change of weather. Um, so there will be opportunities for people to um, begin to collect and gather and meet, but they can do so outside uh, you know, on benches and, and break their chairs out and do that. Still maintaining a safe distance, I think, until everyone is very comfortable with it. And I think that that's going to help us uh, begin to open up uh, the community rooms. And I can see that evolving with each community room for each development will will eventually allow in those that live there, outside functions that may come in, um, maybe the visiting nurse coming in and doing the blood pressure uh, clinics and so forth, that may begin. But having like a regional um, bingo scenario where people come in from outside of the development, that that might be uh, on the outside waiting to uh, occur. But I, I'm hoping that the weather, the change in weather, um, is going to alleviate the stress and the, and the clamor to want to get up and running. I'll also say that when Mary Beth spoke about gratitude and Gretchen, um, I think that one of the things that's going to come away from all this when we get through it is a deeper uh, sense of gratitude or gratefulness that people are going to have. You know, if you've had cancer and you've beaten it, um, it really changes your life. And I think that everybody that's going to survive COVID, while probably in the end, know somebody that's been affected by it, whether they... Um, became positive and then recovered, or they succumbed. Uh, someone's gonna know about it and know someone. It's gonna be deeply personal, but I think that's gonna foster more uh, gratitude. So I'm, a, I'm a, uh, an optimist and I see the best is yet to come. But right now, everyone has to be vigilant and uh, keep doing this good, hard work because it's, it's necessary. Um, and, it, and it's very hard to do. I do have probably, you know, three to 5% of my population that are highly stressed. 
uh, deeply strained by it. And it's not a matter of not having the food. It's not a matter of not having um, an outlet. It's just the, the sense of the, the walls just closing in. But um, as Lisa said in the beginning, the eyes of the nation are on us. We are the hottest spot in America. And um, we're only behind New Jersey and New York City or New York State. And, um, you know, our hardest work is is right now, the next couple of weeks. So, Thank you, John. Yeah. Okay, Aaron, a uh, question. I know you've already touched on it. Um, not possible to know yet what we're going to look like for June in terms of some of the most valuable events in your seniors' lives and in, uh, well, to date, you know, not forever. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they worked very hard to get to this point. And I know that you're doing what you can to make every moment special um, from this uh, remote learning platform. But um, going into the next school year, you know, we, again, with the concept of a new normal, um, what are your facilities folks and what is your administration talking about? Are you even thinking about that yet? I know the challenge is longer term. I know we're only in this peak now, but I also know that every single one of the people here today is so multitasking and broad based that I just wanted to know, no commitments, but what kinds of things are you discussing? General. Sure. Um, <laughs> so obviously, you know, our hope is is to replicate all of those experiences, not only for our seniors, um, you know, but we have uh, experiences like sixth grade promotion night and some of the plays and all string night that have had to be canceled or postponed because of, of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, our hope is to replicate as many of them as, as we possibly can. We've talked about that rolling rally for seniors where everyone that's a senior dresses up in their cap and gown and, you know, people can come out and cheer for them. Um, you know, we've talked about, as I said before, potentially breaking graduation up into sections so that we can have some kind of ceremony for a certain number of kids at a time so that everyone can have the experience. Um, we talked about moving sixth grade promotion night to the end of the summer. So right before you start middle school, we have your ceremony before um, to, to, to move up from, from sixth grade. But I think the most important thing that we've talked about administratively and that we're planning for um, is to just remind parents that all we're asking you to do is, is do the best you can. Regardless of whether we go back on May 4th or May 18th or August 25th, we'll be ready. The teachers know what they need to, what they need to do to get kids up to speed. We'll pick up the pieces. Just do the best you can um, in the time that we're out now. And, and you know, all of the, it will all come together again in the fall. You know, is this is not meant to add stress to anyone's plate. I, you know, have two little kids here that I'm trying to homeschool myself, um, and it's hard. And so, you know, just reminding yourself that mental health and well-being is the number one priority. And if it gets too stressful, just do the best you can. Teachers oh, are skilled in knowing what pieces need to be picked up in the fall. So, no, that's perfect. That's perfect. And to your point, and I'm, as we go to Mary Beth. Uh, the, it, people need to remember, you know, through Gretchen's question, Julie's question, through Aaron's point, um, through what John has just said, as much as people have to find their own quiet moment and figure all of this out and identify with their own personal new normals, no one is alone. Everyone around the country, around the globe, is going through something, if not the same, then remarkably similar. And we see the athletes, the actors, the you know, the doctors, the nurses, the grocery store workers, the truck drivers, and we have a whole different perspective. But together, everywhere, people will at least relate and remember. And how can that give someone a sense of calm and peace when they feel so isolated and so much of an anomaly themselves? I think to know that and to bring into perspective that this is a temporary situation. To know that this isn't, yes, we have to have a new normal going forward, but this whole shutting down of things and not being able to you know, go out and see people is a temporary situation. It's the steps that we need to take in order for us to go about our lives in the future. And so I think you know, if people can sort of get to that thought of, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and knowing that these these all of these little parts that we have to do play into a much bigger picture of us having a much healthier and maybe you know to the point of having much more gratitude and compassion and really not taking 
as much advantage of those things that maybe we took advantage of before. And the joy that people will start mm -hmm. to experience as they start to, in their new normal, get together you know, at a distance and do things that they miss. That value may come back to some of those things that we consider routine things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So before we wrap it up, Julie, I have a question for you. Um, are we interested in what's happening on the economic municipal front today, or are we going to uh, push that for another day? What do you think? What are your thoughts? Um, well, why don't the, I, can, know the governor I was going to say very quickly, do you want me to do a quick update on what's happening, what the Board of Selectmen in Pembroke are going to be talking about today? Yeah, and then you could, on Thursday, you could kind of go through what they did talk about today. So, yeah, that's probably Absolutely a good idea. Perfect. Go ahead. All right. So on the table today is a pretty tight uh, economic conversation. It'll start at 3 o'clock. You'll be able to watch it on Channel 15, Government Access, live, or you can live stream it through pactv.org backslash live. Um, the selectmen will be hopefully able to get a legislative update from uh, Representative Cutler. But again, remember, the governor's going to be on this afternoon. We're not sure if Representative Cutler will be available to break at 3 o'clock. But then they're going to start discussing things like um, pushing the tax deadline, right? We're getting a lot of calls about excise tax, about um, different due dates and what that mm -hmm. will mean. And unfortunately, the dilemma is not the care of the finances and economic situation of our residents, but the care is the economic picture and future of the town. And Pembroke's not alone. I mean, mm -hmm. the state is predicting a $500 million to $1 billion budget shortfall for fiscal 20, the year we're in now. And early projections on fiscal 21 look as though there's going to be $4 billion less dollars in the Commonwealth to come back to cities and towns as local aid. So each city and town across the state has to take a look at their current economic picture, what they thought they were budgeting for services for next year, and make those changes and decide what can we pump the brakes on now, what should we hold on to for another day, and um, how do we fund some of these gaps, what bridges are available. And uh, the selectmen will discuss that uh, starting at 3 o'clock today, as I said, Channel 15, or on uh, pactv.org backslash live. Julie? Thank you so much, Sabrina, and you're right. Um, all of the towns are going through that. And I know there's some talk about um, the federal government offering assistance to municipalities. So that will, I'm sure Josh will be able to update us more on that because just like Absolutely. small businesses can go apply for loans or, or loan forgiveness, can towns have the same opportunities? Because towns have to pay their bills too. And we all know that. Um, Absolutely. So, so thank you. And we will definitely look forward to watching the selectmen's meeting today at three. And then again, um, on Thursday at nine o'clock in the morning, we'll have a, another full update from you and your crew, which is always wonderful. We also spoke to um, Peg Struzik on Friday and we recorded a little uh, ditty about how to vote um, for the Senate seat that is going to be on the 19th, I believe, uh, Tuesday the 19th is the vote for the re replacing uh, Senator DiMacito. Um, that yes. this vote will go forward, and uh, according to Peg, she thinks that the voting uh, will, will take place in town hall. That will be the one place that people um, can vote, or they can send in um, their, their ballots. And there's a whole process that people need to go through to do that. And we created a video with her, which if you go to pactv.org slash Pembroke, you'll see that, that video um, up there. Do you have anything to add to that about the voting for the Senate seat, Sabrina? Yes, uh, Julie, as a matter of fact, the Board of Selectmen voted to, or I'm sorry, I have to go back and check my notes maybe three weeks ago, to consolidate the precincts uh, to town hall. So all five precincts around Pembroke will be consolidated to one voting location for this election only, and it will be at town hall. And parking will be throughout the rear parking area, but entrance to the building will be through the front, mm -hmm. which will you know, be challenging. Um, so the more people who absentee vote, the better. Um, we're going to have, apparently, the clerk is going to set up uh, tables around the rotunda so that there will be no individual um, booths for right. people to walk into, worry about contamination. There will be masks worn. There will be, um, you know, minimal poll workers at a safe distance, letting people in only a few at a time. So they'll be able to maintain that distance and they'll be able to do um, a safe 
job as best they can. But if the numbers were reduced by people taking advantage of absentee voting, right. that would be key. Right. And uh, there's instructions on the website. She has the form right there. All you have to do is fill it out and you can drop it in the mailbox, the back of town hall, and she will leave you your ballot, mail you your ballot. You can mail it back. It's all very sterile. Yep. I dropped my my um, absentee ballot off uh, on Sunday, right in that mailbox. It's very convenient, very easy to do. Um, so thank you. And it's really important. We need a senator to represent our our, our district, and currently we Absolutely. don't have one. So it's really important. Okay, thank you. Especially now, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All great uh, information today, Sabrina. Really, thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, all the guests. And um, like Mary Beth said, breathe. I mean, you're, you're right. We're getting to that point where you've, you've noticed there's a lot of people that are getting really antsy, and it's totally understandable. And we don't want to ruin all the good work that we've done. We need to keep at this for a few more weeks, and we can do this. Pembroke is a wonderful, strong, united town. We can do this. Um, so we will see you again, Sabrina, and your guests on Thursday at 9 o'clock. Please be, feel free to watch this on replay at pactv.org slash Pembroke. Wash your hands, social distance. Please stay positive and try to take a breath. Breathe. Thank you.